as you can see, this is called Christianity in the Holocaust, or Judaism in Christianity in the Holocaust, different names, but it's um, pretty much, this is the question being dealt with the role of, I could say, religion in um, Elie Wiesel's night. And um, let me see, how do I make this go to the next one? I think it's over here. Yes. Well, this is this book is one I'll that has okay. Yeah. This book is one that pretty much has, in a lot of ways, according to many critics, shaped the discourse or the narrative, as people tend to say nowadays, about the extermination of the the extermination of the Jews during World War II by Nazi Germany. And many of you might have read this book in particularly this edition, which came out in 1960 and then was reprinted many times, in a translation from the French by Stella Rodway. Um, and um, this is the original edition in French of the book from 1958. There is a lot of discussion now about when the way we talk about the Holocaust now became the way we talk about the Holocaust. And um, there are different notions about how much it was spoken about in the 1950s. And there are those who say, along with the Eichmann trial, um, Wiesel's night is formative of something that really started in the 1960s, this discussion, the way we talk about this um, issue now. Um, and here is a later edition. Indeed, many of you might have read it in this edition as well. It has, you know, it's just been um, printed innumerable times. Um, and now, this is, this is where things become interesting. And this is how I'm going to introduce my um, discussion of Judaism and Christianity in um, Nights. The book had originally come out, or a version of the book, of what was to become Night, La Nuit afterwards, um, came out really, came out first of all in 1956, a memoir in Yiddish called Und die Welt hat geschwiegen, which was a part of a series of books about the destruction of European Jews that started coming out in Buenos Aires right after the war, when Buenos Aires became a very important Yiddish publishing center um, after having been on the periphery of the Yiddish world. Just to make sure everybody here, I'm sure a lot of people know what Yiddish is in this room, but those who don't, it's a language that was used by the Jews of Eastern Europe and by the descendants in the United States, in Israel, in um, Western Europe, in Latin America, um, which owes a lot to a common Germanic ancestor with the German language, but it is enriched by words from Slavic and from Hebrew and Aramaic, and it's written in Hebrew letters even though it's a Germanic language. And so the name of the book was in the Welt hat geschwiegen and the world fell silent. And the title indeed is very different from Night. Um, and what's interesting is that, well, this is also these, uh, a Yiddish book or a Hebrew book, can, it re opens from the other side because it, the script reads in a different direction. So from the other side of the book, from a book in English or in Spanish or in French. And so you can actually use the back cover, if you, as it were, as a front cover from somebody looking at it from the point of view of a non-Jewish language. And um, here is the, the, the um, French, the um, Spanish title page, El Mundo Cajaba. Um, and his name also, Eli Wiesel's name appears there as Eliezer Wiesel, Elijah versus Eliezer, a different prophet, which also can um, be interpreted. I don't think anybody ever has talked about that difference. I did somewhat in an article, but not very much. Um, and this whole series was, is quite interesting. It was really a beautiful series with interesting book covers. Um, actually, a friend of mine worked on it. that will see that in the next screen. Um, and with, you know, just very suggestive illustrations. Um, <coughs> this is the uprising of the Warsaw Ghetto. This is the famous frieze, the famous sculpture by, um, I just thought of the name and it's just, this Rappaport, thank you. And um, this is a, another book in the series. Um, and here is yet another one, the um, destroyed Jewish settlements. And this is my friend who in Argentina is working on um, these various um, book covers. Um, 
And okay, now what's interesting, so there is something one can call a pre, I would call it a pre-original version of, of the book Night or La Nuit um, that came out in Yiddish. And he, it, he um, and Wiesel himself only addresses the question in his memoirs that came out in 1994 um, in French first and then this is the English translation which came out shortly afterwards. Um, and then he takes up the question again in the latest translation into English that he did with his wife Marion in 2006. And interestingly, the English version then is the basis of a new French version. So Yiddish, French, English, English, French, but not back to Yiddish. Um, and yes, Oprah, as I point, very possibly she featured the, two, the new, two, new 2006 translation of Night in her book club to silence the scandal of her having hosted an author whose memoir turned out to be false. So this was supposed to be a guarantor of the truth of the memoir. But as um, all these narrative theorists have made clear, there really is no such thing as a memoir that could be devoid of literary embellishments, reworking. If you think about the fact that you cannot even recount two things that happen at the same time, you have to do it um, successively, and so there is no way that a story can be completely the factual um, from the moment it is narrated. Um, and indeed, um, this Ruth, Ruth Franklin, the literary critic for the New Republic, noted that Knight indeed is not a very good example of the infallibility of the memoir. Um, and it's included sometimes in books that are, it's, they're no longer done this way, but there were trilogies including two novels and Knight, which is a memoir. Um, um, okay, now this, what's interesting is Yiddish indeed was, what well, we're going to talk about this in a second, was not very much an object of study for a very long time in the wider world outside of, you know, a certain Jewish world, not even in the Jewish world in general. And um, Holocaust deniers even nowadays, I mean Yiddish has sort of become somewhat of a popular object of study now, and even Holocaust deniers somehow get their hands on the Yiddish and, and manage to get it translated. And so here is one Holocaust denier, a minimizer on the web who makes a whole big deal about the fact that in the, in the Yiddish and French and even English original translations, um, Wiesel is not quite 15 when he is arrested and sent to Auschwitz, whereas um, he is 15 in the newest edition and this is considered to be something that somehow questions the veracity of the whole historical knowledge of the Holocaust. But that's another issue altogether, but it does show you that you know, things can very often have strange consequences. Um, why hadn't Wiesel mentioned the earlier Yiddish text? And there's a series of reasons I have kind of come up with, perhaps other people can come up with ones as well. Um, one of them is definitely the lack of prestige of Yiddish in the 1950s, a language that, as Wiesel himself put it, was close to extinction at the time. It was a language hardly spoken of in France where the book first came out. And in the United States, it was hopelessly associated with an immigrant past that Jews wish to forget. Um, you know, just this kind of shtick, everything Jackie Mason, or here you can see kosher comedy, and the Three Stooges who would use Yiddish words in their... Um, in their um, numbers, in their, uh, in their, in their numerous, numerous um, sketches. Okay, also, another possible reason why hadn't Wiesel mentioned the early Yiddish text is that indeed they are two different books, and that is definitely an arguable point. Um, and Rachel Hertel, who is, I would, is the founder, as I point out there, of Yiddish studies in France, has put it, reading Wiesel in French and reading him in Yiddish are two different experiences because the state of the two languages are so different. Whereas French classicism imposes moderation, understatements, and a mere outline, une pure is the original French word, Yiddish produces excess hyperbole reiteration. Night is a sober, taut book, whereas, and the world remains silent, is a torrential one, and this is reflected in the fact that the 239 pages of the original are compressed into just 164 in the first French version. And um, here you have um, uh, Irving Howe, who is an important literary critic, um, who has said you have to lower the temperature, rhetorically speaking, 
when translating Yiddish into another language. And we just came up with a silly illustration of that. When will I ever stop asking rhetorical questions? Okay, now here's another possible reason Wiesel did not mention the earlier Yiddish text, is that they reflect a strategic change. So this is somewhat different from Ertel's notion that it, it reflects a um, linguistic, different linguistic universe, a different stylistic universe. Um, and this is David Roskies, who is a very important Yiddishist, um, who wrote in 1984, a while ago already, themes of madness and existentialist despair are not as highlighted in the Yiddish narrative, which ends with the engagé writer's appeal, engagé meaning committed in a political sense, in the Sartrean political sense, to fight the Germans and anti-Semites who would consign the Holocaust to oblivion, since no one in the literary establishment of the 1950s was ready to be preached to by a Holocaust survivor, existentialist doubt became the better part of valor. And I would argue this is a very tendentious, a very slanted reading. I mean, there's something to it, but it seems to be overstated. Um, and this indeed segues into reason number four. Wiesel wanted to hide something not only inexpedient, but highly problematic. This is the thesis of Naomi Seidman's very interesting, but I think, um, you know, uh, tendentious indeed, 1996 article called Elie Wiesel and the Scandal of Jewish Rage. Um, her main thesis is that Wiesel in the reworking in French and then subsequently in the translations into English removed all traces of rage against the non-Jewish world for his inaction in order to secure the help of French Catholic writer François Mauriac and make the Holocaust a universal concern. Now this is, this idea of like a strategy on his part seems, you know, to um, suggest a very great prescience on his part and, um, you know, seems like a little bit um, anachronistic put that way. Um, but this is, some of her points are from the historical and political specificities of Yiddish documentary testimony a genre which I, never, I, I don't know really existed as such. I mean, there was certainly books of historical nature about the Holocaust at this point, but to make this into a kind of genre is indeed reifying things. Wiesel and his French publishing house fashioned something closer to mythopoetic narrative, the word night itself, supposedly conjuring up images. Uh, some, they, I think the word is used in sometimes almost feudal um, allegorical kind of uh, um, you know, danse macabre or some kind of um, allegory of that nature. The world is no longer blamed for being silent, so says Seidman, according in, in her reading of the new version or the French version. God now is, Christianity gets off easy. This is indeed a very tendentious point. Mauriac writes in his preface, and I, who believe that God is love, what answer could I give to my young questioner? Because he presents Wiesel as coming to him as a man who no longer believed in God. Um, did I speak of that other Jew, his brother, who may have resembled him, in other words, Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified whose cross has conquered the world? Did I affirm that the stumbling block to his faith was the cornerstone of mine, and that the conformity between the cross and the suffering of men was in my eyes the key to that impenetrable mystery whereon the faith of his childhood had perished. So Moriac's point is that suffering indeed is proof of God's existence. And um, of course he doesn't really go into why it would be that the Jews would have to suffer. I mean the idea is suggested that somehow um, it has to do with Jesus and perhaps even the fact that you know, Jesus was a Jew. But it's sort of like, you know, it, it, it's, there were those who say, well Moriac you know, he sold to, I mean, Moya was a very important writer, a very good writer, somebody who was in the resistance, somebody who could not be impeached for, um, you know, as having been anti-Semitic, but someone who had, a, was deeply Catholic and obviously of not the same religion as Wiesel. Um, now, this is sort of one, of, I'm sure this, is a, this, this passage is one that if Elie Wiesel could remove from his past, it would be this one. Um, the erasure of scandalous Jewish rage, is clearest from this change between the Yiddish and French versions toward the end of the book. In French, lendemain, quelques jeunes gens coururent by mer, Weimar, ramassaient des pommes de terre et des habits et couchaient avec des filles, mais de vengeance pas trace. In the next few days, a few of the young men ran into Weimar to bring back some potatoes and clothes and to sleep with girls, but still no trace of revenge. And in Yiddish, Ab zum Morgen sind in Yiddish Abochen gelaufen, kein Weimar, kein Dates 
Kleider und Kartoffeln und zu vergewaltigen deutsche Schicksals. Die historische Mitzvah von Nekoma ist nicht mehr Kuyim geworden. In other words, the early the next day Jewish boys ran to Weimar. These are people who had been in the camps. Um, Kedets, oh I'm sorry, um, to Weimar to steal clothing and potatoes and to rape German girls. Now this is obviously pretty um, dicey stuff. The historical commandment of revenge was not fulfilled. These sentences are absent in the French version and in all subsequent versions in English. Now, What's interesting about this strange passage, which indeed is strange, um, is that it doesn't, seem, it doesn't seem to be rape in any real sense. While rape of German women by Soviet soldiers is well documented, there seem to have been no such crimes committed by Jews. Jew, because Jews were in various places after the war in Germany, in um, displaced persons camps, deep, what often referred to as DP camps, really all over the place in Germany. And it's in the Soviet sector that Soviet soldiers were known. It was almost promised to them by um, their command. command. And then there were those who said, you know what, well, maybe, you should, maybe this is not the best um, policy. But um, it really seems to be um, just not the case that there were Jews who actually were, do, you, any, were doing this. I'm sorry, were, were involved in this kind of action. But still, this is, this is Sardin's best piece of evidence, and Wiesel never addresses this. He addresses other things, other differences between the Yiddish and the subsequent French and the English versions, but not this, um, which is, you know, it's certainly a question. Now, um, but beyond the, the totally scandalous sentence about rape, which probably was just, I mean, almost, I mean, was certainly in the realm of fantasy, um, this other sentence, the historical commandment of revenge was not fulfilled. I mean, it's a kind of unusual sentence, the historische mitzvah. Um, now, how should this sentence be understood? Now, this is, you know, perhaps this is the most obvious sense, an expression of regret that revenge could not be taken. This is... What? No, I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> It is an appeal to a Jewish, not Christian, God of vengeance. That's strategically the appeal. That strategically disappears in French for a Christian audience. Now, but it could also be read as a Jewish rejection of seeking revenge in the diaspora, since such behavior would be suicidal. This has a long history. OK. So, um, so as, as I'm saying, revenge as archaic, historisch. Um, it's kind of, I mean, it's hard to read. It's a very strange sentence. As a Christian residence, turn the other cheek, as in Matthew 539, Luke 629. I don't need to explain that here. Um, or beyond any religion as acknowledgement of the impossibility of avenging an unprecedented mass crime, the murder of six million. Um, so yes, it's, I think the sentence is not quite as clear as um, uh, Seidman makes it out. Now, this is also very interesting. However, the Yiddish version is, is uh, is it the, is it the um, historical documentary text Seidman claims it is, as opposed to what she sees as the Christianized religious French translation? Um, and there was some, uh, already sufficient anger against God in the original. Now, this fellow, Peter Mansell, is very interesting. He was, he is, the son of a defrocked priest and a defrocked nun, um, Catholic, obviously, and who became interested in Yiddish and I worked for a while in the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst. It's fine, just stay by the mic. <laughs> you just, I talk very loud, so they hear me. So just talk I don't louder. Talk loud. No, I talk louder. Um, okay. The opening lines of, okay, so this is fellow wrote, the opening lines of the Welt of Schrieben are missing not only from night, but strangely from Seidman's comparison of the words. So this is the very beginning. This is, you know, um, what, she, what, what Seidman characterizes as a text that really isn't about God, isn't about questions about God. But the Gathot Geschwiden begins in one hand, in the beginning, as do most Yiddish translations of Genesis and the Gospel of John. Indeed, there are translations into Yiddish um, of the Gospels. Um, by both groups that, you know, she, I mean, mostly by groups that try to proselytize among Yiddish speaking Jews. Um, actually, one of them is very good, made by this fellow um, who ended up in Baltimore, Einspruch was his name, and it's really quite, it's very, it's very nicely in Yiddish. Um, Wiesel, Wiesel leans clo in close to scripture, unafraid to show his resemblance to it. He nods graciously to his influences and then spits on them. In the beginning was belief, foolish belief, and faith, empty faith, and illusion, a terrible illusion. 
We believed in God, had faith in man, and lived with the illusion that in each of us is a holy spark from the fire of the Shekhinah, which is the divine presence, that each, of, that each one carried in his eyes and his soul the sign of God. This was the source, if not the cause, of our misfortune. Um, so there is already a theological element in the original Yiddish, contrary to what Seidman says. Um, and as another important Yiddish, Ruth Weiss happens to be the sister of David Roski's, but um, as noted, uh, there was more disappointment than rage against the world in the Yiddish original. Um, Okay, and indeed, already, additionally, the most Christian scene in the book, the hanging of the three prisoners, not these were seven prisoners being hanged, or seven members of the Yudinat being hanged, but the hanging of the three prisoners and the death of God, because there is a scene, I don't know if many of you have, I'm sure many of you have read it, whether you remember this particular scene when there is a little boy being hung next to two other um, prisoners who are also being hanged. Um, the, it is said, who is that? That's God. Where is God? Somebody asks and says, that's God, the child who is dying. And so this definitely has Christological resonance. Um, and, um, is, and that scene is already in the Yiddish original. So there are lots, there's lots of problems with, and it's also, what's, what's, why am I going on about the side of the meaning? It is really generally accepted to be the truth about this question of a book, you know, um, which has become a very central book, as I suggested in the beginning, regarding the discourse about the Holocaust. Now, um, Christian iconography, moreover, had already been used to portray Jewish suffering in the Holocaust, as it were, before it happened or when it was starting to be clear that some unprecedented form of, of repression, of, um, extermin of, of, of persecution of the Jews was about to take place. And here is a painting which I'm sure many of you recognize, right, Crucifixion by Marc Chabelle in 1938, where a religious Jew is shown as a figure of Jesus. Um, and here is another writer, an important now, um, well, now most of all remembered as an Israeli writer in Hebrew, but he also was a Yiddish writer, and here is um, a poem of his in the form of the cross, obviously, and it, he talks about the relationship between Israel and the nations. Um, here is another important Yiddish text called The Cross about Pogrom. Uh, okay, so here we have, um, okay, here is another text of Christological nature in Yiddish. Um, actually, this is the cover, I just kind of like the uh, frontispiece of the book with its kind of style, I guess, somewhere between Al Nouveau and Art Deco. Um, 1929. Okay, and this is also very, uh, this is also not taken into account that. Um, indeed, Christology becomes so important in Yiddish literature that one of the best-known books, especially, not, very often nowadays, I would say, forgotten about, whereas you know, someone like Rosheva Zinger is remembered, but um, this is a Yiddish writer who would, um, was at that point in settled the United States who was writing completely um, Christological novels about Jesus, and he was at a point that's sold as, you know, a novel based on the life of Christ, and there are all these kind of you know, rumoring, uh, murmurings, these rumors that um, Shulam Ashad actually converted to Catholicism. Um, so, but you can see now this, this is in Yiddish, and actually to show you the importance of this book, this happens to be in the, this is the copy of the book in English in the, um, in the, in the um, library of the university where I teach, and a little piece of doggerel verse from Christmas 1939, but again, just to show you in a world very far from anything Yiddish, this is what is, you know, what, what is known of Yiddish literature. Um, this gift is not so big in size, but the contents I am sure is nice. If I were able to give what you deserve, I'd give a million dollars. Isn't that some nerve? Okay, in any case, so <laughs> um, But this is, again, the point is to show you this is totally random, and this shows the importance of the book, how it got into that particular copy, got into university collection, probably some text in um, <coughs> Bibliophile gave it to the school. Okay, now this is also another question. Um, does not all secular art, literature, and so forth proceed from a Christian worldview? And this has to do with the very important verse from the New Testament. Look at this. It's the same thing. I know, but it seems to minimize the frequency of the Christian worldview. 
<laughs> render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God. What is God's. Okay. Christi and this is a, there's a French theorist named Marcel Gaucher who has said that Christianity is a religion that provides a way out of religion, indeed, by this notion that, um, but of course, you know, we, we know like the long history. Um, Christianity is a religion that provides a way out of religion. Um, it opened, in other words, it opens up a space for the secular, such that indeed throughout um, the Middle Ages and beyond there, there is, you know, a lot of um, tension between the church and the states as they were um, developing in modern states, as they were developing in um, Europe. So, um, indeed, there is two, uh, it, it opens up a new space. So there is no way for non-religious literature, by which I mean not just things written, but actually things that would call themselves literature, um, you know, in the sense like novels, um, poems, etc., Jewish or otherwise, not to partake of Christianity. It's really impossible. Um, so my theses are that Wiesel's encounter with Moriak had an effect other than leading Wiesel from Jewish particularism, which is the way it is, it's been styled, to Christianophile universalism, it helped him to make a more reasoned return to his belief in God and accede to a more nuanced belief, that of a modern man of faith. Um, and I would argue that rather than um, uh, adding religion, as it were, it's the secular skepticism that Moriac gives showing how a writer in the most um, aesthetic sense of the word, could also be a um, committed Catholic, which in France especially, where so much of literary, of so many literary figures are very much aligned with the secular French Republic's ideology. Um, and I would say that Moriac enabled um, Giselle to see that secular skepticism did not have to be a part of literature, and indeed how deeply secularist and anti-clerical most Yiddish intellectual culture always was. Um, indeed, I think if any of you went to um, Yiddish schools in New York, um, generally um, religion was certainly not, or religion as to be practiced, even if not as just a traditional, as an element of Jewish tradition, was indeed not foregrounded. And how fond it must have seemed to Wiesel, who grew up not in the streets of Warsaw, where Jewish secular culture was very important, but in the remote Carpathians. Now, this is, this is somewhat extreme, uh, to extreme versions of life in um, Poland between the wars and life in the Carpathians between the wars. But this is, this is the, the uh, Bund, the um, Jewish secularist movement. Um, and um, you can see the worker, the socialist imagery, and um, the fighter, the combatant. Whereas the okay, this uh, the word Jews like this also in war. Really, even though they spoke Yiddish, was not a major part of of um, uh, Wiesel's cultural background. Um, okay, we just, I will just read this quickly. Um, we'll go back for a second. Okay, there were elements of Jewish modernity, but they weren't Yiddish. It was um, modern Jewish signifiers, um, modern revernacularized Hebrew, in other words, the Hebrew that would be spoken um, in the state of Israel, um, and just talk about the general socialist and um, or the um, progressive ideals of a future Jewish state. Um, they are as opposed to um, anything regarding Yiddish. Um, and uh, really, he only learns formal Yiddish grammar and reads Yiddish classic writers after the war, not as part of his childhood. Um, let's see, how can I wrap this up? I would say, well, this I'm just going to just make a very bold jump and say, rather than saying that the religious part of, not, of, of, of Wiesel's book, not the, um, not, um, the set, not, let's put it, that it's not the religious part of Wiesel's book that is Christian, but it's rather the um, aesthetic elements which are necessarily Christian. Um, and that if there is a Jewish, particularly Jewish religious component, or there is a religious component, is a Jewish one of the trial of God. In other words, how could God have let this happen? But this is kind of very much condensed, but um, I'd be happy to develop anything.